Hey everyone, welcome back. It's another episode of Believe in Vikings. We are on the on the air today, Friday, August 9th. Excited to bring in a special guest to talk football, to talk quarterbacks. It, it's Matt Sims. More on him as we uh, welcome him into the show in a bit. But first, let's take care of some business. Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything online sports betting. Right now, you can receive a 50% free bet of up to $250 on your first deposit to bet on anything from the Olympics to baseball to Formula One racing to Matt Sims season long over unders. <laughs> Bet Online has every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. When the game's over, head on over to their online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or unwind with one of their over 150 slot games. Head to the website today to get in on the action. Use promo code BELIEVE, B L E A V, for your 50% free bet credit on your first deposit up to $250. Bet online, the game starts here. And the podcast, Believe in Vikings, starts right here. I'm your host, Wabi, with you as always. But we have a special guest joining us today, and that is Matt Sims to help us break down the Vikings quarterback play and all things NFL. Hey, partner, how you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to uh, the Vikings fans. And, uh, you know, I just... I get excited because all I want to do right now is just go school, you know, like yes, that's, that's just how pumped I get when I see uh, the Vikings and all that. So uh, appreciate you having me and uh, let's get into it. Let's talk some Vikings, man. Yeah, man. Well, let, you know, what do you think of the squad? Um, I, I, I think I, you can't help but start at the quarterback and that's a good spot for you to start because <laughs> right. you know there that play. Yeah. Um, so I'm imagining you're going to start there. But, um, you know, overall, what do you think about the Vikings? I think they're in an unusual spot, at least. You know, since since Zim came to Minnesota, even through Kevin O'Connell's first year, the Vikings have been, if not the favorite, the second favorite. I think they're in a little right. bit of a different spot this year. So what do you think of the squad heading into 24? Yeah, I mean, first of all, let's just start with the head coach. I am a huge fan uh, of Coach O'Connell and just what yeah. he has done. And even, too, just the, the, the fact that he had – you know, the ability to endure, obviously, what he went through a year ago, right? And, and that was not an easy year, really, for any head coach. But I thought he really did a great job of just carrying himself, right, in, in a really unbelievable manner, uh, a great leader for this football team. And I know that he is kind of dealing with the, you know, the unknowns of his future contract and his extension and whether or not they're going to keep him and all that. Uh, I really do believe that this guy is uh, head coach material. And not just head coach material, but like, you know, more than above average. This guy has got it. He really does. And I think he's got a great pulse of the team. I think he has a great pulse for his quarterback room, which is obviously a uh, one of the more exciting quarterback you know, rooms that we'll be discussing really all season yeah. this year. And I think that he is more than capable with all the things that he has gone through with his own personal career of developing each one right? The way that he feels like is necessary for them to win now. And, you know, for them to be as competitive as they were a year ago with the situation that they had and surviving with the whole Josh Dobbs, everything, uh, I really do have uh, the utmost belief that the Vikings will be one of those teams that are, that are battling and vying for a little bit more games late in the year than, than maybe we give them credit for to start this off season. Cool. You know, you, you talk about Kevin O'Connell. I think that's a great place to start, Matt, because not being in the building anymore, which I used to be, it it just takes a little bit longer, and you're just your your analysis is is a little bit more incomplete, you know, on on like what is this right. guy about and can he do it? Right. And a couple of the things that really stood out to me about him were person from a personnel standpoint. There there were two moves the Vikings made early on in his tenure that worked really well for them: the trade for T.J. Hawkinson, yes, and Actually, I'll say a third one too. The trade for Hawkinson, um, running back Cam Akers last year actually yes. was the best looking running back in the offense. Mm -hmm. And no surprise because he came from the Rams where O'Connell was. Right. And then he O'Connell brings him to Minnesota. So he looked the best of any running back last year. And then I do believe that the Jordan Addison pick was like a Kevin O'Connell, like kind of put your foot down like we're just stay there and take this guy it's gonna yeah, work right so that told that like i see the those successes and i'm like he really is dialed in mm -hmm. on what he's doing and who he needs to do it you know what i mean I, I totally agree with that and i think he he really did a great job that that's one thing that you know obviously 
with Jordan Addison this offseason. That that's something that we'll see what happens as that continues to develop with with his uh, offseason DUI yeah. and whether or not that'll affect you know s- game suspensions and all that kind of stuff. But just you know, Justin Jefferson being healthy, Jordan Addison being healthy, Aaron Jones being healthy. And then, yeah, the question mark really then goes to that tight end position. You know, TJ, how is his development coming back from his injury? And then now with Tunyon, you know, battling a few injuries here too in camp early on. You know, so the skill group is kind of set and ready to be made. The offense that he runs, I think, uh, allows an offensive line to, to, to really be able to be flexible in a way where, you know, it's like a Kyle Shanahan offense in a sense. There's not a ton of just like one-on-one my guy versus this guy in in the passing game and the running game. They do a lot of great things deception-wise with their play design, with the movement, with the play-action passing that they do, that they really alleviate a ton of pressure in the trenches. And, and of course, we have to remember, too, that he's going against Brian Flores every day in practice, and that really allows him, too, to understand the weaknesses of a old-school team that's thinking – no, hey, we're going to just keep getting after it and we're just going to keep attacking you as a defense. And I think this really allows him to to really build into his offense really natural ways, right, for his quarterbacks to manipulate those defenses. And then, of course, obviously execute versus the very vanilla type defenses that they see throughout the season. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about how the operation or the mechanism of of using play action and using tight ends to sort of alleviate pressure from the offensive line. Uh, that was an interesting comment you made. And I, that's one of those things. Like, I think I can see it, but yeah. I don't really understand it. Like it'd be like watching you solve a Rubik's cube. Like I see how you're doing that, Matt, but I couldn't <laughs> right. pick that up and do it. So could you right. explain that a little bit? And then while you're sort of thinking about that, the reason it's, it's pertinent in my mind is, you know, Sean McVay has always been, to me, like an 11 personnel guy. Right. But the last couple of years, I I see more 12 and 21 from him. And I swear it looks to me like Kevin O'Connell is bringing the offense back to more 12 and 21. Yeah. So I'm really curious your thoughts on that and how that can help the offensive line. Yeah, it's it's a great question, and it's really interesting, too. And I was fortunate enough to even this offseason to hang out with uh, with Coach O'Connell really just for like. 30 minutes at, at, at one of those Super Bowl parties, but it was like okay. one of those like 30 minute conversations where, you know, I kind of felt bad because I kind of kept following him. And even though I'm sure he was like, all right, dude, like I'm done talking <laughs> to you. Like, but just to kind of hear his approach to just the week that he goes into, right? Uh, I asked him very straight up, just like, you know, how was it handling a young quarterback, right? And Josh Dobbs, who hasn't played a ton. And then also it hasn't really gotten experience in your offense, you know? So hearing him say like, yeah, like a lot of the stuff was, you know, making sure that he was comfortable with it, but then also trying to make sure that we were doing enough offensively to continue to push the defense, to put them in binds. So there was that, that constant, you know, tug of war battle, right? When we were having these conversations, installing the offense, but to go back to your question, you know, when I hear him speak about his process through the week, he's, constantly watching you know what his what his predecessors or the people that he really respects in the game right do and Sean McVay Kyle Shanahan uh Matt LaFleur you know all these guys they they come from the same type of philosophy as far as how to attack defenses which is west coast oriented right but they kind of have that new age twist to it and I think what he does is he kind of goes, he looks at what they do. He kind of sees why they're running their schemes. And then he goes, well, we don't have the personnel to do this and this, but that's a good, interesting thought. Maybe I can apply this to a different personnel in a different formation and attack a defense in a very similar manner that gets my quarterback easy completions or an easy run. And the whole 12 and 21 personnel thing that you're mentioning, I think is really just like a natural state of football. You know, we see these unbelievable, it's like the stock market, you know, it's like the market rises and falls consistently. And with us in football, the same way with our philosophy, we went spread out, we went wide open, we went RPO, we went quarterback run heavy. So now all defenses, that's all they think about is how do we line up properly versus all these open formations? And now you're seeing the opposite in effect. Well, 
you know, when we shift our fullback or the tight end back in the backfield and go to a 21 personnel like set, two backs, one tight end, two receivers, you know, the defense is having trouble lining up to this. They're having trouble with their run fits. Now we have a smaller, uh, agile linebacker who can run sideline to sideline, but doesn't really want to get into that downhill running game as aggressively. He's great in the pass game, but he's not going to really fill the gap as aggressively as some of our old school, you know, 90s and early 2000s linebackers that we saw. So you see these trends happen in the NFL, and there's no doubt that, you know, Kevin and them, they're all seeing what are, what the other is doing and kind of copying and pasting what they can apply to their own team. And yeah, I would not be surprised if we see more of that from Coach O'Connell, especially too if we see a young J.J. McCarthy play a little bit more early on because that's what he's more comfortable with from Michigan. But yes, I, I do see that trend from the Rams. It fits Matt Stafford really well. It fits Sam Darnold and J.J. McCarthy really well. And ultimately, that's really what you're trying to do is build an offense and a scheme and a philosophy that fits the people that you have in the huddle. Yeah. And I think unless you've got three just dynamite receivers, I think you can really make an argument that you can be even more like diverse and explosive in the passing game with a tight end that you can move around and absolutely operating out of 12 or even 22. Yeah. You know, I mean, Hawkinson, Addison, Jefferson, I would argue is definitely, yeah, that's a good crew. That's a good crew. And it's, it's better than if you had took Hawkinson out and put your standard WR three in there, it'd be better than that. So let's not forget Aaron Jones either, who is a fantastic person out of the backfield with the screen games, with the check downs of getting those extra Mm -hmm. dirty yards. He does really good, do a good job of running physical with the football as a pass catcher. So that's another added bonus too, that I think, you know, all these gentlemen that we spoke to really love those type of football players that, you know, they don't really check one box where they're like, this is what he dominates in, but they check a lot of boxes and they're very versatile and they're very flexible. And that's where, you know, for me, the Minnesota Vikings biggest question will really be health. You know, when, mm-hmm. when Justin Jefferson missed, what was it? Seven or eight games last year. Yep. That mm-hmm. That's really the, the bulk of your season. And when your yeah. best player is not out there, it's very difficult to overcome that. Uh, and then to run the offense that you ideally would like to, uh, to to take pressure off your quarterback. Yeah, there's just there was a lot of change in injury at at quarterback with yeah. uh, with Jefferson. Yeah, uh, the whole thing. Um, what do you? How would you describe you know the quarterback room with McCarthy and Darnold and a draft pick from a couple years ago, Jaron Hall, um, yep. a, a veteran like Nick Mullins. There's just a like fans, media. They're trying to figure out. Is Darnold ahead? If so, by how much? How close is McCarthy to starting? Like, there's this constant scorekeeping, right? <laughs> of course, yeah. Who, who's yeah. going to play in the preseason game and who's not? Who's going with the ones? Yeah. Oh, my gosh, McCarthy's with the ones. Does that mean this? So <laughs> that's just really noisy, right? Yeah, of course. What's, yeah. what's it like in the room? I mean, you've been there. Like, what what are they talking about? What are they seeing? <laughs> what are they reading? What do they care about? Uh, I'll tell you this, none of that stuff that you just mentioned, uh, not at all. I mean, it really is like you were so wrapped up in a bubble as far as just what your day to day day to day operation is and what you really need to accomplish that day. The install that you're trying to, you know, really instill in your offense, right? The communication that you're trying to build with teammates, right? And, And those things are just, they're so time consuming and it takes such a, it takes such a, a a patient mind too to do those things that you know to to look at what you know good morning football or what we're saying yeah. and all that like d- doesn't even cross your brain for a second you know and if it does come across like social media or whatever like you know as you scan through it with the the 10 minutes of free time that you have you know you you kind of like look at it, you're like huh, like if they only really knew what it was like in the exactly. room right now yeah. you know so the cool yeah. thing is is that Most quarterbacks, even though we're competing for the same damn job, you know, we really do a great job of supporting each other because we know how difficult the position is. And we know that, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, only one guy can play it. And if you support him, well, you know, I expect you to support me in return too, you know? So it is a little bit of that quarterback brotherhood that way. And I expect that, that they're operating that exact same way. 
And, uh, you know, the good thing yeah. is, is that they got four really good quarterbacks. Even Jaron Hall, I thought he was doing some good things right before he suffered his his concussion in that that first game, which I believe was in Atlanta when he Atlanta. got his first yeah. start. You know, yeah. when I first saw him play, I was like, wow, like, dude looks like he's comfortable. He looks like he's moving well. He looks athletic. And then, of course, the injury happened and, you know, we really never got a, an opportunity to see it again. But, uh, you know, the good thing is, is that he's got a few guys that have had real NFL snaps, a young guy that really has uh, tremendous promise as well. Yeah. What's your uh, general philosophy on, well, you know, I think that like you look at how CJ Stroud started. And what you know the path that Houston. Let's took let's him, take him out of right? it, right? Because okay. he is a total anomaly. He really I, is. You think so? Okay. I mean, to be a rookie and to be, you know, I thought I'm like, hell yeah, he's an MVP candidate. You know, like that's yeah. that's crazy to me. You know, we don't yep. see that a ton, you know, and, and nor should we really expect that really from any of the other young rookies that are taking the field this year, too. Uh so CJ really has set like a very uh, unfavorable precedent for for the rest of the yes. NFL here for the next few years. <laughs> and so you juxtapose that with like the path Aaron Rodgers took, right? Right, exactly. Where it's like you, and Jordan you Love. Sit, literally you sit for three seasons. I yeah. mean, think about that, you know? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, but that's like, you could argue like, yeah, but that's why Rodgers turned out to be so good. He might not have been fully you know, baked in the oven if you would have played him as a second year player. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. but, but then it's like, well, that's why Stroud is so good. Cause you played him right away. If you would have made him sit for two years, he might, you might not ever know who he is. Right. Yeah. He went to play Absolutely. yet. Yeah. It's just, cr so, so you think teams have to be like, okay, this is this guy. He's his own person, player, man. What is good for him? Right. And then you have to develop a plan that's tailor made for him. There's not, a, you can't paint with a broad brush when it comes to quarterback development, I don't think. No, no, you, you absolutely can't. And that's where, you know, big picture wise, let's get like super hyper focused on the Vikings. You know, I think the best thing for them to do is to allow Sam Darnold to be the starter. It sounds like and it looks like from the articles that I've read, the highlights that I've seen through social media, that he is performing extremely well right now in camp. And you let him endure, unfortunately, the first quarter or quarter and a half of the season and, and see what, what happens. Because that's what's really, I think, people kind of miss out on a lot, you know, when we evaluate these quarterbacks, especially, you know, like even in our area, Daniel Jones and New York Giants, like, oh, he played terrible last year. You know, the first four or five weeks of the season are like absolute chaos absolute chaos offenses yeah. <laughs> are like we don't do this well we can't do this i don't know yeah. let's try yeah. to throw just throw justin the ball like let's yeah. just do that you know yeah. and uh, around that fifth week sixth week <laughs> seventh week all of a sudden you're like okay yeah like hey we we got an offense now we're figuring it out we can do something we can move the ball we we know what our identity is and how to play into that and you know unfortunately yeah, that is something that I would say I would like Sam Darnold to endure rather than a 21-year-old rookie from Michigan who, yes, I know is handling it like a professional and doing everything that he needs to, but I don't want him to endure that with a team that, you know, is still kind of finding its way, right, with all the pieces that it's added this year. So uh, I think Sam Darnold being the pro that he is and the, and the guy that really is has been through it all. You know, him, Geno Smith, you know, these are guys that like they've they've been through it. They've been cut up. They've been chewed out. And now, you know, they're mature men that are ready to, to lead. And that's why I would just lean with let Sam go out there. Let J.J. watch and slowly build confidence as he watches the game of saying, yeah, I could probably do this. Actually, yeah. you know what? I know I can do this as you continue to watch it. That's what happened to me. I made the team like. By this much on the Jets, watched a few of the games. I'm seeing Geno Smith out there as a rookie, and I'm just like, oh, Geno's getting killed, you know? And <laughs> yeah, meanwhile, yeah. I'm like, but I think I can play, you know? And yeah. and that's like, what do you got to do? And, you know, you, of course, know that you can play. But I think for, like, a J.J. McCarthy, it would be great to kind of get that confirmation of just, like, see it, see how the operation is, watch the game, see the difference between preseason football and regular season football because there is a difference and really just 
gain that confidence week in and week out with what they're doing and also allow the team to kind of figure itself out too during that time yeah. period. Yeah. So I really think that was the team's intention, Matt, is, okay, offseason starting. We're not going to re-sign Kirk, so what are we going to do? Uh, right. We're going to sign a veteran. We don't know which one, but we've got a short list of guys we want. Oh, we, we ended up with Sam Darnold. Cool. And we're going to draft a quarterback. Again, don't know exactly which one, but we like these three guys. Okay, we yep. got J.J. McCarthy. Yep. And, you know, we're going to start the veteran. And we're going to bring along, un unless we end up with Caleb Williams, which we're not going to, we're going to bring the guy along, right? right? And so I think that was their intention. Then you get those guys in the building, and I think you they probably told them, this is what we're doing. And so the point I'm making is the team has a plan, and they over-communicate that plan to the players. Outside yeah. the building, it's back and forth and up and down, and now <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. this, and McCarthy looks good, but Darnold's playing great, but McCarthy looks better, but now yeah, it's yeah. this. And I think like... There's just – they don't match up. Like what's yeah. going on in the building is not matching up with what is going on outside the building. You and it's I mean? funny too because even when I was a player, you know, it, something came across Twitter when I was with the Falcons and they're like, oh, look at this terrible play by this quarterback. And, you know, there we were in the quarterback room where we're like, that actually was the exact read <laughs> and decision that the quarterback had to make and so-and-so didn't run his route the right way. And, you know, he wasn't in the proper position and that's why the media is funny, you know? So yeah. it was just one of those things where it's just like, yeah, they can think what they want, but ultimately in the room, you know, we're being very honest and transparent with each other. And so were the coaches and, you know, we're not there to, to help each other feel good about ourselves. You know, like we're there to yeah. push each other and to make sure that we're, you know, making, making the proper strides as a team and as a unit right, to help our team win. And, and that really goes from the starter all the way through to the third and fourth quarterback. And that's why those conversations of that, you know, being like a caddy for the starting quarterback, right, those yeah. are real. Like, hey, man, when so-and-so run his route, like, you know, I like what he did here, don't like what he did here, you know, this and this. Like, you know, uh, this young two who I've been working with a lot, you know, he's going to be in the ones tomorrow. You know, just – make sure that he knows what he's doing. Like he's not really on it all the time. Like, you know, so all these conversations happen and it's not to, to point out, you know, Oh, who's the wink leak. Who's there. It's really just to make sure that you're communicating to make sure that yeah. you can help each other out as much as humanly possible. The best relationship like that, that I ever witnessed myself, Matt was in 2009. We went into the season. I was with the Vikings. We went into the season with Tavares Jackson and Sage Rosenfels as right quarterbacks and then yep. it wasn't going great so that's when the brett Favre trade or brett Favre thing happened right and then we, we signed Favre. the the way sage supported Favre in that way was really cool to like watch and they i don't i wouldn't say like they were friends and close right like i would even wonder if like is Favre is brett annoyed with like sage a little bit here but <laughs> but from a perfect and maybe not but like from a professional <laughs> standpoint their relationship and the way Sage was like a value add in that role was really yeah. a cool thing to watch. And that was probably my fourth or fifth season with the team. So I, I was learning a lot and it was really cool. And yeah. like, yeah, it's like real. even though, yeah, even though you, you hope your backup quarterback doesn't play, you need to have like a good backup quarterback who knows how to be a backup. You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. No, it, absolutely. And that the, the whole caddy example that I used too was something yeah. that Sean Payton told me. Uh, I went oh. to a rookie mini camp with the Saints, and he was just like, you know, to be a great backup is to be a great caddy, you know. But the only difference is, is that you can pull out the club when you need to and and hit it on the green just as well as the starter. So, cool. you know, yeah. that that was uh an experience that I think was tremendously important for me. And you know, even when I go back to Atlanta you know, in my experience there, because Matt Ryan was the best quarterback that I've been around in the NFL at that time. And the backup is Matt Schaub. And then I'm the third quarterback there. And I played my role. My role was really to be the guy that like, I just cut through it. I just told you exactly how I saw it, you know, because you guys are dealing with the head coach and the offensive coordinator. No, this is stupid. This is smart. Uh, this is what I think. You know, and Matt Ryan and Shaw be like, you're crazy or no, hey, you're right this time, you know? So, yeah, yeah. but I just was very open that way with like voicing my, my, my heart and opinions with them because I knew that they were also playing the other game, right? 
And yeah. I didn't have to play that other game because I was the 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 practice squad quarterback, right? And you yeah. know, so these are what what the dynamics in those quarterback rooms are so important. And everyone kind of has to fill that role. And everyone needs to really tap into just like what is best for the football team. You know, so who was I? I was the I'm the gunslinger. I'm going to, hey, if I ever play, let's just roll. Let's do it. You know, we're going to play fast. I'm going to cut it loose. I'm going to throw as hard as I can every damn play. You know, that kind of guy. And yep. Shab was the more cerebral, veteran, calm, yeah. cool, collected guy. And then Matt Ryan, obviously, one of the greatest quarterbacks in our generation. So yep. we all played that role. And as, like, the team watches us, we all kind of have, like, almost like we're like a little gang in that sense, you know, yep. where it's like each one's like, oh, there's the wild card. There, there's the smart one, and then there's the guy, you know? So yeah. we're a little bit of an entourage that way. We all play our role. We all do it, you know, for the betterment of each other's successes and for the 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 group of the team. And, you know, I think that's what Kevin O'Connell really brings to a team, too, in their quarterback position as well. Being a former quarterback, he understands those things, you know? Yeah. He, he, he innately understands what these guys are going through and knows how to kind of push the buttons appropriately. And you even heard in, uh, or I read, excuse me, in an article where he's like, yeah, I threw, you know, JJ McCarthy in there knowing that Brian Flores was going to run a crazy defense. And I just wanted to see how he would handle it and then how his recall would be after. And then if he would learn from that and apply that to the next practice, right, or the next film or whatever, when we discuss it and really see how he, you know, digested all this information, you know, in a short period of time. Yeah, very cool. What uh, what's your plan for the season, Matt? Where everyone listening and watching, where can they find your work and and follow you during the twenty four season? Yeah, so I do uh, Sims Complete with Phil Sims. Uh, you know this this average New York Giants quarterback that I decided <laughs> yeah, to do right. a podcast with. Yeah, just yeah. some dude. Uh, but yeah, do do the show with my father. Our show is primarily focused around the quarterback position, but we do review other things uh, around the NFL, but yeah, Sims complete a part of the believe network. You can find it on believe YouTube page on our YouTube page as well. It's Sims complete and, uh, available wherever podcasts are available. So yeah, we'll be, we'll be talking ball, uh, little Sims and big Sims, uh, all season love long. It. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, keep it up, man. You guys got a good thing going. I also love hearing you on serious NFL radio. So, um, Thank you. I enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to get some help and run you down later on in the season so we can check in with you again because uh, this was awesome. a fun conversation. Yeah. No, thank right, you man. so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you again. Yep. Take care, Matt. All right. That's going to do it for today's episode of Believe in Vikings. This is Wabi signing off for now. But until next time, everybody, remember, keep believing.